Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're joining us. I'm Anya Grigas of the Atlantic Council. And today we're gonna to have a discussion on how Europe can escape Gazprom's gas grip. There's been a lot of activity the last few months to suggest that the Russian state owned company Gazprom has been putting a squeeze on the European gas markets. Uh, we've seen a decrease in Gazprom's gas transit to Europe. We've seen Gazprom drive up prices. We've seen the European countries having to start uh, drawing down on their gas reserves. Um, Russia has also reduced gas flows to Ukraine and Kiev has been starting to feel the gas uh, crunch and a financial crunch. So, and all of this is already ahead of the winter se heating season. So as the Russia watchers, as gas watchers, um, you know, we're looking for a very informative discussion today on what we can expect this winter um, in what people are already calling the European gas crunch. Um, so we'll be discussing today what that will mean for the European and the Ukrainian gas security and security overall, and what policymakers can do um, in the, both the European Union and the EU and the US uh, to mitigate um, Gazprom's uh, crunch on the European markets. So today we'll have, um, we'll start with a very informative presentation by Sergei Makogan, the CEO of um, Ukraine's gas transit system, the gas transit system operator of Ukraine. And then we'll have a panel discussion with uh, Margarita Sanova, senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation, Deborah Kagan, the Distinguished Energy Fellow at the Transatlantic Leadership Network, Alan Riley, um, a fellow non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and myself, as I mentioned, I'll be your moderator. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council. So really without much further ado, I'd like to kick it off um, to our presentation by Sergey. So when Sergey, whenever you're ready, please. And I also say after the presentation and after our panel discussion, we'll be having Q&A. So please start thinking of your questions. Um, you can start entering them in the Q&A um, discussion bar. So please, Sergey, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you. Good morning, evening, good day to everybody. Uh, let's start the sharing the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So I will... Uh, run through the presentation and after that ready to respond to all your questions. So to make sense of what is happening in Europe today, uh, let's have a look on these uh, charts. Between March uh, and July this year, European gas futures uh, have doubled in price and uh, then they doubled again in the half of time uh, uh, from July to September. What we're witnessing in Europe is just the present day rerun of the oil shock in the United States uh, experienced in the, uh, in the 70s. Yes, and the commodity is different. The safeguards are stronger, but the underlying dynamics are the same. It was not the lack of oil, oil tankers that pushed the prices up and triggered the economic recession in Europe. Those were political motivated decisions by the dominant oil producer to withhold supplies. As a gas uh, transit operator and reliable partner of Europe, uh, we have offered transit capacities at every auction, but Russia failed to book them. The most important point here is that uh, there is no shortage of transit capacities. While the Kremlin is holding up Nord Stream 2 as a, some kind of miracle cure to the Europe energy problems, roughly twice as much gas can be shipped uh, from Russia to European Union through Ukraine. So let me say it again. Uh, the equivalent of two Nord Stream 2s is sitting empty while Europe can't get enough gas. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how, my, how many times I've heard the phrase that Gazprom is fulfilling its contractual obligation. What they forget to mention is that contractual obligations have nothing to do with the ability of dominant supplier to manipulate the prices. On sep September 15th, Gazprom announced that uh, it uh, that it, its gas production has increased by 19% this year. So where did it uh, go to? Clearly not to the European Union. 
Gazprom is taking gas from its storage uh, located in Germany, Austria, and elsewhere in Europe to deliver on its contracts. The gas reserves for the upcoming winter are low across the continent, but at the facilities owned by Gazprom, it's getting to a single digit. This kind of market signaling proved to be a very effective tool for the Kremlin. What Gazprom is communicating is that it will not ship gas to Europe through Ukraine, and that pushes, pushes uh, the prices up. Next slide, please. Yes, we have, a, we have signed a five-year contract with Gazprom to transit a pre-grid volumes uh, of gas. And on top of that, we are constantly offering additional capacities and uh, monthly, quarterly, and daily options. Our job is to transport the gas from Russia to Europe, and the success or failure of every auction depends on the supplier that can take uh, our offer or leave it. And uh, as you see here, the market response to Gazprom's decision not to ship through Ukraine has been very clear. Every time, Ukraine, uh, every time Ukraine's capacity were booked, the prices went down. And the prices went up every time they went. The last auction happened just a few days ago when the spot prices in Europe were already through the roof. Gazprom has had a, a snub at our offer, and what we saw is highest price price jump here. So uh, dominance is not a crime, but the abuse of dominance uh, uh, to impact prices or achieve other geopolitical objectives is something Germany and Europe must respond to. We uh, all know that Nord Stream 2 what is what it's all about. So, but it's still worth to repeat. It is energy weapon by design. This pipeline is without any commercial justification, and it will bring no new gas to Europe. Its only purpose is to weaken the Ukraine's security, to create divisions within the European Union, and to undermine the transatlantic alliance. Continuity of gas transit is our strongest non-military buffer to further Russian aggression. And even if gas continues to flow through Ukraine, Nord Stream 2 will uh, render our transit route dispensable and leave our country much more vulnerable. If anyone was still wondering about the origins of the European gas crunch, the Kremlin spokesman just told us. If it is not an effort to blackmail Europe, I am not sure what is it. The German-American declaration uh, has made it clear that the transatlantic community will not allow Russia to weaponize energy against Ukraine and Europe, as it has done many times in the past. With that in mind, we have identified five red flags to watch out for. Any one of them or a combination of a few must trigger a robust response. That would be the only way for the West to maintain credible deterrence going forward. In the, in the nearest time, I will not go into details right now, but I hope we can discuss it uh, later uh, during our panel discussion. The weaponization of Nord Stream 2 is not a hypothetical scenario. It is not a possible one-time event in the future. It is ongoing process that begin on the day the pipeline activity commenced. The weaponization of ambiguity is what we are witnessing. The situation is getting progressively worse, but no one can point to a single dramatic event that, sh that should trigger a decisive, a decisive response. The majority of European uh, member states rejects Nord Stream 2, but that is not stopping the pressure campaign by Moscow to get it over to finish the uh, to finish line, no matter what. Allowing the competition. Uh, allowing the completion of the project was always a terrible idea. By doing so under pressure is demonstration of weakness that Germany and Europe will uh, inevitably regret. Now, this is the last slide uh, just from our backup. As you see, the, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the gas, uh, the level of gas in the European storages uh, comparing to the previous year. Obviously, the 
level is significantly below the average. So this is it uh, from my side. I try to be as brief as possible to leave uh, additional time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sergey. You painted a very, very worrying picture in the skyrocketing gas prices in Europe, the fact that European countries are already drawing down on their gas reserves, and we're only in September. I mean, we're not even in the full of winter. Um, so we can really expect a potential gas crisis this winter, and the Nord Stream 2 is not even in you know full operational swing at this point. So this is very concerning. And, um, you know, again, as a as you've noted in your presentation, we're seeing you know history replay itself. We've seen this situation previously, numerous gas uh, crises that have been instigated by by Gazprom um, in the past in Europe, even with you know casualties in previous uh, winters um, um, when there was no gas, and you know there was a you know Europe depends on gas uh, so many countries for their heating season. So Sergey, I wanted to ask you, you know, you're as the head of the gas uh, transit system operator of Ukraine. What are you and your colleagues uh, in the Ukrainian government doing to respond to this, you know, near crisis situation that uh, we're heading towards? Thank you for the question. So, uh, what we can offer uh, as a transit operator? Uh, first of all, we're offering additional capacities. So it means that we're constantly offering capacity, saying that guys. We are ready to uh, deliver more gas, but somebody, the supplier, should send this gas uh, to Europe. Uh, we are uh, uh, investing a lot in, into our infrastructure to make it uh, more reliable and to ensure that everything will be okay during the next winter. What we're doing for the local market, yes, the, this is more uh, about the creating the local uh, storages, uh, the gas in the local storages and Ukraine. Expected to have 19 billion cubic meters by the start of the heating season, and we believe it is enough uh, uh, for Ukraine for the average winter. But definitely, uh, we also consider some uh, uh, some hybrid scenarios which potentially could appear during this winter. For example, yes, we have a ship of pay contract. But we are more interested uh, right now in the ship side of this contract because we need actually gas to be shipped. Gazprom, with these current uh, prices, uh, uh, as I understand, they expect to have net profit about uh, 20 billion dollars. So definitely, it's not a significant amount of them, one billion to pay Ukraine, but not to ship. And we hope that actually they will ship gas. So uh, from our side, uh, we did everything which was required uh, from Ukraine. We made unbundling, we implement all necessary European network codes, uh, we developed the transparent tariff regulation, we allowed in the, uh, third party, uh, third party uh, access to our pipeline, so we're fully aligned with European energy re regulation, and we're ready to work as a normal European operator. So unfortunately now, the move is not on our side. And Sergey, to follow up, um, you've outlined a number of ways how you know Nord Stream 2 is essentially now being used as a weapon already um, in the European gas markets. Could you suggest um, what uh, you would like to see from the European Union and the United States in order to try to mitigate uh, some of these risks that we're already facing? So first of all, uh, uh, the our initial proposal, which we uh, actually support, uh, we support the proposal of Poland that the moratorium on uh, physical completion of Nord Stream 2 uh, should be introduced uh, before the uh, change of the uh, of cabinet in Germany, in order to be able to develop the uh, the decision on Nord Stream 2. Unfortunately, we understand that Nord Stream 2 is already finished. So now the question is the certification. And our request, and uh, we will uh, follow it very closely, is that certification of Nord Stream 2 should go in, in complete alignment uh, with the requirements of third energy package without any uh, uh, exclusive or any uh, uh, 
any exemptions from the uh, from this uh, certification process. We believe that Nord Stream 2 should be certified as an independent uh, system operator under ownership and bundling model. First, second one, uh, it should uh, the third uh, party party access to the pipeline should be ensured, and the third one is the tariff uh, for this pipeline should be transparent and based on the European uh, regulation. So this is uh, the necessary thing uh, uh, for the certification, but also we insist that the continuation of transit contract to, through Ukraine also should be signed immediately, not waiting till the end of 2024. So it would ensure the uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that that Ukraine will uh, will have the uh, the contract and the transit flow after 2024. Thank you, Sergey. Um, you know, this is an action plan that you've outlined that I think you know a, a lot of uh, European countries support as well. Um, so I'd like to turn now to our panel, to Margarita, and please, as I said, oh, we are seeing some questions already coming in. So please do um, start collecting them. Um, Margarita, I wanted to ask you. Um, you know, we often use um, sometimes, you know, Gazprom and you know Ru Russia interchangeably. Uh, you know, when uh, we have our expert discussions here, but I wanted to. Uh, to for you to break down for us, how closely is Gazprom really tied to the Kremlin? You know, we know it's a state-owned company, but to what extent um, it, is Gazprom being used really as a tool of uh, the Kremlin's, you know, foreign policy of its geopolitical aims? Uh, thank you, Agnia. Thank you for having me today for this very interesting and very timely panel. Gazprom is not only a state-owned energy giant, but it is also the only energy company, the only gas company that can export Russian pipeline gas. Uh, this is provided in the Russian tax code. So the, the, the company is designated as the only exporter of Russian pipeline gas. This gives Gazprom um, enormous power, but that power derives from the Kremlin it is submitted to the Kremlin and it is used by Vladimir Putin for geopolitical purposes. Thus, Gazprom is serving as a powerful instrument to implement Russia's foreign policy doctrine, which in the post-Cold War period uses energy exports uh, for leverage and for subversion in Europe. Examples of the Kremlin use of geopolit for geopolitical purposes are numerous, from increasing five-fold Russian gas prices in Ukraine after the Orange Revolution in 2004 in order to undermine the country's new democratic government, uh, to uh, cutting off gas supplies to Georgia in 2006 to punish Mikhail Saakashvili for his drive to build a democratic Georgia, then uh, the gas interruptions to the European markets, uh, both in 2006 and 2009, uh, to actually bully Ukraine into selling its gas transmission network, a very valuable asset for Russia, and uh, um, uh, present it as an unreliable gas transit state to justify the construction of Nord Stream 2 and South Stream. So this has been, this has been actions that are driven by political purposes, not by energy purposes. Therefore, there are many companies that serve, that are state-owned, and they produce gas, and they sell gas around the world. But Gazprom is the only one that uses gas as a geopolitical tool. The current gas crisis in Europe, which is already a full-blown crisis, in my opinion, with dire implications on many levels, originates in the same place, the Kremlin. The Russian officials' own statements have proven that. The Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, said that uh, a rapid startup of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline, uh, pipeline could help calm record high gas prices in Europe. And Vladimir Putin went even further, uh, poking the fire of the situation by stating that smart Alex in the European Commission were at least partly to blame, having pushed for market-based pricing as part of efforts to increase competition in gas supplies. Now Gazprom claims it does not have enough gas supplies for Europe. Uh, because it has to supply the domestic market. But since it plans to deliver less gas in 2000, than in 2019, 
uh, about 183 BCM this year compared to 199 in 2019. Um, why did the Kremlin need another pipeline to Germany? All the time claiming that European gas demand will increase and only Russia can meet it. Russia right now has 355 BCM of export pipeline capacity to Europe and Turkey. For the 183, always or under 200 BCM of supplies, it sends to Europe. So which one is the lie? That there is no, no enough gas to supply Europe or that they need a new pipeline like Nord Stream 2 uh, to, uh, to provide uh, Europe with increasing gas supplies because of the increasing gas demand in Europe, which turns out not to be true. Thank you, Margarita. I mean, I think you've really outlined what a lot of us um, Russia watchers and gas watchers see. I mean, this is uh, another crisis. You know, this is a story and a playbook we've seen before. Thank you. I want to turn to now um, Deborah. And, uh, you know, Margarita outlined how Gazprom has used, um, you know, uh, energy as a weapon in the past, gas in the past, how we faced these crises before multiple times. And Deborah, could you... Uh, elaborate more how Nord Stream 2 is now changing this equation and what more we could expect in the future in terms of how the Kremlin could use Nord Stream 2 um, you know, as, as another form of um, pressure, as another political tool. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to step back a little bit and, and, and go back to uh, 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 build on what Margarita just said in terms of going back a little history here. Um, since the 80s, Europe has been playing poker with Russia on energy. And Europe has not won a single hand of this poker. Yet somehow in 2021, they think that Russia is somehow going to be different. And the level of naivete and foolishness here is ridiculous. And this is a problem of Europe's own making. So I want to take this broader than Ukraine and, and broader than the whole issue here and, uh, and just go back to focusing on why Europe created this problem for itself. In fact, earlier this week, the EU uh, discussion on, uh, on green energy and renewables was hijacked because you have governments who are worried that their consumers are going to be paying anywhere from 200 to 400% higher utility bills. Uh, and, and in a season where you're talking about massive elections all over Europe, that's just not a good look, as everyone knows. Uh, this, the second part of this is Europe focused so exclusively on green that they leapt right over blue. And what I mean by that is, they didn't look at gas coming from diversified sources, except with the exception of a handful of countries, as a wise idea because they, they leapt over blue to go to green. And as a, a, my colleague Andre Shimoni likes to say, now they're just going to go to brown because to brown, they're going to end up burning more coal to compensate for not being able to have either enough gas to meet their winter energy needs. And oh, by the way, OPEC is watching this very carefully because this gas squeeze is going to affect oil prices as well, which could also go up another $10 a barrel. And when you have Iran starting to talk publicly about Europe's energy crisis and how they're willing to help, then you know you've really stepped in it, that you've just made a mess of this whole thing. And, and that's what I wanted to, uh, to start with in terms of saying, here's the issue. Um, I don't want to be to say, gee, Europe deserves whatever it gets, but this is not this is not unexpected. It would be naive to think that the Russians wouldn't squeeze the market. Um, the the stories about Russia saying, oh, we we don't have enough to meet our own energy needs, and that's why we had to lower the amount going to Europe, which of course drives up prices. Uh, but the truth is, Russia chose to sell larger volume to Asia when they got a higher price for it recently. And that's why Russia is saying it doesn't have enough. It has nothing to do with domestic consumption because as you all know on this panel, even better than I, Russia has no problem squeezing some of its own domestic users as long as they're not essential, uh, essential manufacturing facilities for the Russian economy. So I, I just wanted to lay that out here is, will Nord Stream 2 make this better or worse? 
I don't think Nord Stream 2 on its own has that uh, ability to do that. But if you combine this with Turk Stream, which uh, Margarita has written about and talked about extensively, uh, and which most people don't look at, then it becomes a real issue. So I think the next thing to look for is whether Russia is going to start squeezing the uh, the gas that it's been selling through TurkStream that goes through Turkey right now uh, and into the Balkans. And if Russia decides to start doing similar approaches on its gas flow to Europe through TurkStream, then Europe's really, really in a deep problem. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, certainly, um, Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream together, I mean, uh, from the beginning, they were designed to eliminate the Ukraine from the gas transit business and to g provide Russia even greater leverage on the European gas market. So with those two pipelines in operation, we can certainly expect, expect a tighter squeeze. Um, I wanted to turn to Alan now. And um, ask you to consider, you know, right now some analysts and uh, you know Nord Stream two proponents are saying, well, given the current you know uh, gas crunch in Europe, given the skyrocketing gas prices, well, maybe you know Europe and Germany in particular need the pipeline now more than ever. So I wanted to, um, you know to see what you make of that argument, how you respond to that, and could we really expect for gas prices to come down once um, and if Nord Stream two is fully operational? I think, I think the problem with that argument is, of course, as any one time, like as of today or yesterday or three months ago, there's 100 billion cubic meters of spare Ukrainian transit capacity, which could be kicked in to deal with this now. And so the, the, that argument that we need Nord Stream 2 is manifestly incorrect. And there's actually a very strong legal point here, because any attempt to say, well, we need Nord Stream 2 because of the emergency of high prices. Well, can, can it be legally challenged by the Commission or a, a European member state, such as Poland, before the European courts? And they'll say, well, there's no emergency because there's 100 billion cubic meters of spare capacity which can be used. And it's extremely difficult to get around that argument. So I can see that the, although obviously the argument will be trundled out, it's a very difficult argument to sustain when there's all this huge spare capacity which could be kicked in today. And I think that's really important in all of this. Thank you, Alan. So turning to Margarita, if we continue to see gas prices trending up as they are, um, what will really what will that mean for the European economy uh, for businesses? Um, I mean, again, especially ahead of the coming winter. And with Gazprom's leverage on the European gas markets, can we expect to see similar shocks in the future? I mean, I think uh, the answer that, to that, I mean, it would generally be yes, given the history we've had, but what can we really expect um, in terms of the economic impact? Unfortunately, the economic and social impact are already taking place and uh, and they are uh, causing a devastating damage to economy to uh, to the society, and it's going to start causing damage to the political leaders and, and uh, political parties and being reflected in, in elections that are coming up, as Deborah said. What we saw in uh, in Britain is was very telling. Two companies, two gas distribution companies, uh, local ones, went out of business, went off the market because of the high gas prices that can, they cannot sustain. Electricity prices uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe are going up, Utility bills are going to go up, and we know what happens when, when an energy prices go up. The energy prices are the most sensitive and most consequential factor for social uh, development, for economic development, and for politics. In Bulgaria in 2013, when the gas prices, when the electricity prices went up, people were on the streets protesting. The government collapsed. There were no elections, new government had to be formed. This is the very simple formula of what uh, energy, high energy prices can cause to, uh, to uh, entire societies, entire countries. And now we have COVID and we're barely starting to recover from COVID. And this um, high energy prices, instead of uh, having lower prices uh, like last year or the, the year before, well, prices were about $5 per million BTU. And now we, last year were about $2 and $3. And now we have 15 and a half 
15 and a half. This is three times higher than what we have in 2019. Uh, and economies that are devastated in many of the poorer countries in Europe. The social unrest we're going to see is going to be mostly in the poorest uh, European countries, in those that are still going through transition, economic transition, in those that uh, are still dealing with political challenges, um, we are going to see a lot of social protests there that is going to challenge the political leaders. And that is what Russia takes uh, advantage of. If politics, the legitimate democratic politics are undermined, then populist parties can be helped by Russia as well, as they are in many countries in the region. Um, uh, some more radical parties, some nationalist parties. This is a very good opportunity, whatever, whatever serves Russian interests, to use gas this time and gas prices this time as a, a subversion tool causing social unrest and political turmoil. Thank you, Margarita, for really outlining that. And uh, certainly we know uh, uh, Russia has meddled in various European elections. Uh, um, now for, you know, last decade uh, from, you know, the smaller countries, the more vulnerable countries to the larger countries. And with the, you know, with the gas crisis we're facing, this just provides more opportunity. Now, Deborah, I wanted to turn to you. Um, it seems like, um, you know, some politicians in Europe are trying to take a step or trying to take action. Some 40 members of the European Parliament have asked the European Commission to investigate Gazprom's role in manipulating the gas market right now. So it, could you give us a little bit more insight of what we can expect here? And if the commission indeed finds that Gazprom has been illegally using its market power, do you think uh, this would be the opportunity for the European Union to, to finally take some steps to try to impose some restrictions on Nord Stream 2? Or what other actions we could expect to see from the European Union or the commission? Thank you. I want to. Uh, I want to. I want to just. Um, I'm. I'm just going to briefly just counter one statement that uh, Margarita made. I don't think that this is going to cause uh, dissent and problems just in Europe's poorest countries, because if you look back here, the whole French Yellow Jacket protests, and France is not one of the poorest countries, were be, were because of high gas prices by truck drivers and people who were working in the manufacturing sector. So I think um, this is this is a, this will have an effect more across Europe than just those handful of other countries. And I think we should keep that in mind. And if you think nefariously like Putin does, that's all a good thing. Uh, going back to this, I think there's a lot of politicians saying the right kind of words. I know that Greece, Cyprus, a handful of other countries have announced and are looking for EU subsidies to uh, underwrite the uh, underwrite the losses that they expect to take by the higher uh, energy prices they're going to hit this winter. Um, I know that there was uh, also a uh, move to try to, at these EU meetings this week, to walk back some of the carbon taxes and other taxes that add to those prices of what consumers are paying. But I will say more directly to your question is this is a it, this is a question of greed versus doing what is right. Um, and in the case of Germany and the amount of money that Germany would make as upstream providers, which you know uh, our colleague Ben Schmidt has written about extensively, uh, is has always, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, trumped the uh, <clears throat> the need to sort of follow what the EU uh, unbundling regulations say, and uh, so I am not confident that the desire to make more money out of this, which there will be people in Europe, uh, uh, Total owns uh, fifteen percent of this, uh, Royal Dutch Shell owns a percentage of this pipeline who will make money on these price markups. And I'm not sanguine at all that the EU has the wherewithal and is strong enough and the European Parliament is strong enough to put regulations in effect that would thwart what Russia is trying to do. And I think Russia is very confident uh, that it can uh, make sure the right palms are greased so that uh, 
there's a lot of talk, but very little action. Um, and, the, and, and I think a lot of this depends on weather. If it's going to be a cold winter, um, because the EU had invested heavily into wind power and the wind didn't blow strong enough. And so there was no reserves from that. Um, one could argue that it didn't invest heavily enough into the right kind of green renewables and therefore is, is going to be stuck. But all that being said, I, I am not sanguine that even with all this chit chat in Europe about how this is a bad thing and it's going to do this and it's going to do that, that they are going to be able to um, overcome uh, the, the difficulties that Russia is going to put on them. And in any event, I understand that the penalty for Germany uh, and, if, and even if it was a new German government to back out of the deal, I think there are ways to do it. <clears throat> but the penalty, because they signed a, a really, I, you know, I would never, that negotiator seems like really incompetent. It would be over 10 billion euro penalty for them to back out of this agreement at this juncture. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. So we're wrapping up towards our time towards Q and A, but I still want to give um, you know Sergey and Alan a chance to comment. Um, Sergey, I also wanted to ask you, where does this leave Ukrainian energy security? And you know, also, you know, we talked quite a bit in terms of what you know Europe could potentially do or what Europe is not doing. What would you like to see? What kind of support would you like to see from the Biden administration? Um, and then I'll uh, ask Alan as well to start thinking about your your answer. Um, Alan, you, you know, you've written a lot about Gazprom's uh, gas transit policies, uh, um, especially regarding Nord Stream 2 and how these could potentially uh, hinder the company's access to Europe. I mean, you know, that they could be, you know, pushing this a little too far. Um, what, what do you think would be the chances that Gazprom's uh, attempts to pressure Europe and drive gas prices up could ultimately backfire against the company? So let's start out with Sergey and, um, and then Alan, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so regarding the energy security, so uh, in our case, it consists of uh, two actually uh, separate things. The first one is the energy security related to the ability to bring enough gas to Ukraine uh, in case of the high demand, uh, low temperature and stuff like this. Right now, Ukraine has only uh, firm capacity only with Slovakia, which is limited to 27 million per day, which is not enough to cover our uh, peak demand. So what we expect and what we uh, asking uh, the, the, uh, the US administration and the European partners that we need to expand these capacities significantly. So, and we see two, um, uh, two directions. First one is Slovakia. Uh, there are four big pipelines. Uh, two of them are not in use anymore because of this reduction of the transit through Ukraine and actually Slovakia. So we propose to uh, reverse one of those pipelines to create the firm capacities directly from Baumgarten through Slovakia to Ukraine. So it would uh, give us additional 60 million per day of uh, potential import. And the second one is the creating the, uh, the firm capacities uh, for importing gas from Poland. Right now, Ukraine is ready to take from Poland 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters uh, per year. Unfortunately, uh, now the Poland is not technically ready to uh, submit any cubic of meter of gas uh, to Ukraine. So now what we do impact from Poland is the virtual reverse. It's a swap of gas uh, with, the, uh, with the Russian transit. And we all understand that after 2022, the contract between Gazprom and Poland expires and it will be no flow through Ukraine, it, at, at automatically it will be no uh, possibility to import gas from Poland. So what we're asking for, it's the firm capacities from Slovakia and firm capacity from Poland with access to LNG terminals. This is the first part. The second one is uh, uh, to have the, to continue to have a transit and to have physical transit, not just the uh, uh, pay side of this ship or pay contract, but both ship and pay. So we insist to have a new contract for at least next 10 years 
with the amount of at least 45 billion cubic meters per year. We believe that with such amount, it will be Ukraine will still be quite important uh, uh, transit company for Europe, and we might expect some interest from Europe to the situation uh, at our eastern part of, of Ukraine. Thank you. And Alan, please. Sure. I am. Um, I think the issue here is that it's not just about European energy security, it becomes a more existential matter. If you have a situation that um, Gazprom is seeking to use its energy leverage to force through Nord Stream through, to, through the EU regulatory processes, you end up with a much bigger issue than just European energy security and even high gas prices, because it becomes kind of existential. It's, you know, does European Union law apply in all your EU territory and to all actors, including Russian actors, uh, even in the energy sector? And if that isn't the case, then that threatens the entire e e body of EU law, the acquis. So this is this is something that becomes almost a point at which you can't say, you cannot back down. This is why I would disagree with Deborah to a degree. It becomes this much bigger issue and one of the ways I would recommend Gazprom to look at this is to go and look at the British um, negotiations over Brexit with the EU, is that essentially the UK thought it could do deals. It could, to some degree, negotiate the single market, negotiate EU law. And the EU turned around and said no. Um, and I think they perhaps should have get the British negotiator, Lord Frost, as an advisor to Gazprom because he's already been through the through the meat grinder of this once and realizes the difficulty of it. And I think that is where we're actually going with this. It's, it becomes much bigger than energy security. And I also think the other, the backfiring issue of this is if, if you ramp up the price of gas across Europe to try and force this through and, and breach the EU legal system, you're, you're actually creating a situation that even Germany is forced into a, forced into a position of working with the, all, the, all the other member states against that. Plus, you're making yourself, uh, how can I put it, extremely unpopular across the whole of the European Union. So I actually do wonder if there will maybe come a place, a, a point in the next few weeks when actually um, Moscow comes to the decision that this is the price uh, for continuing this is just too much and they back down. We will see if they do that. But if they don't do that and they try and force this forward purely on uh, almost brute force to force the pipeline through, I think it will very seriously backfire. And I think the other thing which is quite significant is that, uh, in this is that it may create a distinction between untrusted Russian gas and trusted gas from elsewhere. And that may actually end up in a situation where we get uh, a view taken in Europe of gas, that gas which is domestic production, gas which comes, say, from the United States or from Qatar or from Norway is trusted gas. And one has far greater access to the European market in the future than untrusted gas. And that is a real danger for Gazprom, which I think they underestimate. Thank you, Alan. Um, you make a very good point on, you know, on the one hand, you know, Gazprom has repeatedly tried to, you know, state that, you know, they are a trusted supplier. On the other hand, you know, the evidence speaks to the contrary. So, you know, we we have to see where Europe will come out on this in terms of what final steps they will finally take. I wanted to turn now to our panel, uh, well, to our Q&A. Um, to, uh, for our panelists. And we have a number of actually questions of a very pleased, very active discussion here in the Q&A bar. So I'll, we'll start with a question from Richard Morningstar, who is the head of our Atlantic Councils, um, the chair of our energy um, program. And uh, he is asking, and I'll, you know, whoever wants to take it actually, I'll uh, let you just jump in and Alan is ready to take it already. He doesn't know what the question is. Okay, you can start out, Alan. So what you see the question and I'll read it. One of the biggest challenges of the US-German joint statement is agreeing on what constitutes Russian malign behavior. And if so, what steps to take? 
Do you believe that present Russian behavior constitutes action that requires U.S. German punitive action? And if you were Amos Hochstein, what would be your approach? I think this is very interesting um, because, of course, we have lots of evidence. I mean, you know, we can go back to Robert Larson's great seminal work on this, which has several hundred pages, goes through about 40 to 50 examples of uh, Russian gas oil delinquency. You know, the 2014-2015 case uh, where they tried to suppress reverse flows uh, to Ukraine. Um, lot, apart from that's before, before you talk about, about the 09 and 06 gas crisis. On top of that, you've got the regular threats and potential cutoffs which EU member states have experienced in Central and Eastern Europe over the last 15 years. And then we've got the current situation. So you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence. I think one of the dangers here in terms of proof is this. If you have uh, this argument over Nord Stream 2, and this is kind of another element of the, back, the, the backfiring potential of what they're doing, is if you have Nord Stream 2 being tried to be forced through and creating litigation and arguments over, for example, the issue under Article 11 of the gas directive, is the non-EU non -EU pipeline provider, that is Gazprom, a threat to supply security uh, of the member state in question, Germany or the union as a whole. That issue is um, uh, open. It can be litigated in the EU courts and a decision ultimately can be made. And I think one of the dangers for Gazprom, which is underrecognized, is the pro prospect in the process of litigation, we actually have some form of decision, a commission decision or a view from the Court of Justice that indeed they are in breach of Article 11. Now, if that were to happen, first of all, then I would have thought the German-US joint statement is, is, is reached, but it has much broader consequences. First of all, Gazprom will not be able to uh, run the pipeline uh, Nord Stream 2. They'll have to find some other way of doing it, selling it. But it also raises questions about Nord Stream 1. If you are a supply security risk, how can you own Nord Stream 1? How can you have uh, shares in storages or shares in pipelines anywhere in the European Union? So it is actually a, a much, I think this is a much more dangerous thing for Gazprom than first appears. So yes, there is that. So my, my argument, with, my point I would make with Richard, with Dick is the fact that what's really happening here is that the, the actual legal processes may create a certain circumstance where we actually have a, if you like, a defensive legal act, which says, yes, they are a risk triggering all of these both soft law in terms of the statement and hard law in terms of Article 11 consequences. Thank you, Alan. Is there anyone else who'd like to take Richard's question? Oh, okay, so we're gonna jump to another question from Voice of America from Danila Galperovic. Um, she's asking, you know, whoever would like to respond, um, what, what could convince Germany and the EU in general to resist Moscow's gas pressure apart from simply their own political will. And, you know, again, we have a similar also question from uh, Madison Malarkey. You know, she's asking, uh, you know, what, what could be Germany's motivation, you know, a similar type of question for supporting this pipeline when it seems clear that it is a political tool. So, you know, could anyone comment on, uh, you know, Germany's stance and, you know, what it could take to change its potential opinion? Um, can I take this question? I don't think anything can change uh, Germany's opinion at the moment, but the election sounds on Sunday. So we don't know what is going to happen exactly. There will be certainly a three-party coalition. That's the one thing we can predict from now. And that three-party coalition may well include the Greens. And once the Greens are in power, they will be having a little bit different take on politics. Whether Germany is in a position now to say no to Nord Stream 2 after so many months and so many so much investment of uh, monetary and, and otherwise um, political in this pipeline, I don't think so. But as Alan has written extensively on the issue, I think the European rule of law is the only thing that can convince Europe that this pipeline, uh, if it's not stopped completely, at least has to be uh, limited 
to the regulations of the, uh, the gas directive and limited to, to a capacity that is acceptable. And we have several decisions already by the German regulator, by a German court denying Nord Stream 2 exemption from the third energy package. Uh, we have the, uh, the decision on the power pipeline uh, by the highest court. It was appeal uh, that Germany filed. Um, to to reaffirm that the pile could be used at 100%, but uh, it didn't happen. The court denied this. So what, what is going to happen eventually if European rule of law is followed the way it is, has been uh, in the last uh, uh, several years, it's not one decision only, it's not only this year, uh, Nord Stream 2 might be put into exploitation, but it will be limited to using half of the pipeline, half of the capacity of a Ugal pipeline. Nord Stream 2 is going to be limited, uh, one is going to be limited to half of the capacity of a PAL pipeline, and only NEL is going to be used fully because there hasn't been a complaint uh, regarding this pipeline. For the rest of them, European energy security is going to be uh, front and center in every decision that European Commission and European courts will have to make from that, that point on, because we have the precedent affirming this with the OPAO decision. Thank you. We have a question from Megan Tetrick, and I, Sergei, I, since you touched on this topic, I'd like you to take it. Well, are, are there realistic avenues through the certification process to prevent Nord Stream 2 from coming online? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? How would you assess that? Um, uh, everything depends on Gazprom, actually. So there is uh, uh, clear rules uh, how the certification could go. So as uh, Alan mentioned, yes, the Gazprom could sell uh, Nord Stream to uh, AG to independent company. Uh, Gazprom may agree to open borders uh, for free export from Russian Federation. Uh, and other things. So I think everything depends on the the tactics the Gazprom will use. So if they will they would agree to the European regulation to the certain energy package to this amendment uh, amendment uh, gas directive, it could uh, be a little bit easier task for them. But if they will insist on the current approach when the they propose ITO model when they plan to certify the Swiss-based company, not the EU company, when they insist to uh, to to have this uh, uh, the, the flow from only from Gazprom, or they plan plan to play some games with uh, with Rosneft or something like that. So I believe that uh, it, it 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 I hope it will take significant amount of time uh, because the I hope that the European Commission would not allow any. Uh, deviation from the standard rules and actually we will fight against any deviations of uh, from such uh, general rules. Thank you, Sergey. We have a question here from Benjamin Schmidt and uh, you know maybe um, maybe Deborah would like to take it maybe someone else but it, you know it's really you know how much will the transatlantic community take and you know the question is what is the path in the transatlantic context to address concerns over strategic corruption? really posed by projects like Nord Stream 2, you know, to be able to lead Europe, uh, you know, you know, to these types of projects, you know, the numerous senior officials now we have that are, you know, get in, involved in these types of schemes, you know, German, Austrian, French former officials who take, you know, post-government positions, you know, working for authoritarian states, uh, owned enterprises, you know, such as those of Russia and China. So, you know, Again, you know how how much will, and how long will the transatlantic community to tolerate um, this type of you know we can say um, projects from authoritarian states that co you know involve and co-opt um, you know European government officials in these schemes? Um, so I'll I'll answer this, and I I I, I don't want to be uh, totally cynical, but there there's such a long track record of of uh, going forward with these schemes and then talking about them and then doing absolutely nothing. And I don't think that there is, I think the transatlantic community is not monolithic. I think that there are enough bad actors within the community and enough of those actors and their, and their governments that are making such huge amounts of money that 
changing this dynamic is going to be a Sisyphean task. Uh, there is no unity. Uh, with We talk about the European Union and unity, but there is rarely unity uh, on, on these issues. And there are members within the EU, like, uh, you know, dare I say, Orban, who is who is making money from both the Chinese and the Russians. And there's other countries similarly disposed. So I don't think you're going to get a, a consensus that it's time to fight back. And I don't know that the population is going to rise up suddenly in every single one of these countries, certainly in some of the countries, to say, we've had enough, this has to stop. And in terms of the transatlantic link to this, I think the US is in this administration is already having its own problems on trying to get unity on issues that from its perspective uh, are even more important. And so I don't know what uh, I don't know what the Biden administration will do on this. And again, this is much broader than Nord Stream 2. I, I, uh, you know, Margarita and I've had this discussion uh, a huge number of times, which is that with, with if Nord Stream 2 is up and running along with both parallel tracks of Turk Stream, 70% of all Russian hydrocarbon output will be sold to the European market. That in itself is stunning. And because it is saying that Europe is essentially underwriting the Russian economy, when you consider how much of the Russian economy is, uh, is supported by uh, hydrocarbons and the manufacturing of hy 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 hydrocarbon related goods. And I think that is in some ways a better way to look at this uh, and, to, and to focus on this and to let the European population know that what you're doing is underwriting the Russian economy. And oh, by the way, all those bad things that Russia does in Europe about killing people and going after opposition people and using chemical weapons and uh, upsetting elections, you're, you're in effect underwriting that. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Deborah. I mean, that's very uh, pointedly put. Um, we are running out of time and we have so many excellent questions. Honestly, we could uh, we, we could be having another hour discussion. I wanted to thank you so much, our panelists, Sergey, Alan, Deborah, Margarita. I will, you know, leave, we have a minute and I will leave a, a final, um, you know, a final comment to Sergey, Alan and Margarita. And, you can comment, you know, your final words, or maybe try to answer this question: if whether Europe really can escape Gazprom's gas grip, whether we can be optimistic um, for the near to medium term. Al Alan or Sergey? Let's uh, Alan. Sergey, pl please. Okay. Um, well, the, what I would say, sir, is simply is that I actually, we haven't talked much about kind of solutions, but obviously there's a kind of emergency planning process, which I imagine in all of the energy ministries across Europe and at the G, in, in, DG, in the uh, DG Energy and the European Commission there are now engaged with them. And the Dutch are talking about uh, switching on part of the Groningen field, which will provide additional supply. You can, with some gas turbines, use oil instead. And I think that's being looked at. We might use more coal. Um, there are a whole series of things that can be done to get through this winter. And I think we shouldn't be getting too dark because too pessimistic because Europe's rich enough and big enough to be able to find short-term solutions and deal with the immediate issue. And then the, the medium to long-term issue is to actually then put in place a policy which will ensure that this can never happen again. And we're protecting from any weaponization of energy flows by anyone, be it Russia or anybody else. I'll stop that. I, I would say, I'm oh, sorry, Sergey, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I would say the construction of Nord Stream and Turk Stream together, if you look at the two arrows coming from Russia, one from the North and one from the South, they're presenting some kind of a pincer movement, encompassing and completely uh, encircling Central and Eastern Europe and squeezing them in these two arrows. 
So what needs to happen urgently beyond this uh, this uh, winter, where I agree with Alan, there will be temporary solutions for this winter, is to break those two arrows, to somehow disrupt them. And Russia has been doing everything possible to prevent the construction and delay the construction of, let's say, the interconnector from Greece to Bulgaria, to limit the capacity of the uh, terminal in Croatia, the LNG terminal that was planned to be 5 BCM, but now it's a lot less than that. And to uh, allow for uh, north-south connections so that Central and Eastern Europe are not isolated and they have enough alternative gas supplies and able to develop their regional markets. The, uh, the, um, the key word is diversification. question is how do you do that? And I think one of the important things to do quickly, as soon as possible, is to sign up more long-term contracts with American LNG providers, with Qatari LNG providers, whoever can bring more LNG to Europe so that you, uh, we have in Europe a significant uh, portion of the gas supplies that is insured through this long-term contract. And that is going to, um, to uh, push uh, Russia to put it on its place as one of the providers of gas to Europe and not the dominant one that can do whatever they, they can, they want, without any punishment. Uh, what I can add, I fully agree with colleagues, and uh, I can say that uh, now uh, there is the commodity, I mean, gas at the market, so it's possible to, to green it. So this is just a matter of time. So I don't think that this winter it will be something uh, terrible and drastic because actually the European countries, especially in Eastern Europe, they already much better interconnected and the gas flows could uh, could go to, to, to this country. So uh, this is just a matter of money. And uh, Alan correctly said that uh, I think the Europe is rich enough to, to solve this problem. But to solve this problem for this year, but for the next year, I really like the uh, the idea of uh, Mr. Riley that uh, the Europe should start considering the Russian gas is not reliable gas and make all the further planning assumptions for the uh, decarbonization, for the substitution of coal, uh, phase out of nuclear uh, plant uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the understanding that Russian gas is not reliable, and definitely it will change significantly the uh, the uh, the behavior of of Russia because they understand that okay, this couple of years they can uh, get significant money from the market, but in five ten years it will be actually a very limited market for them. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Sergey, our panelists, Alan, Deborah, Margarita. This was a wonderful discussion, very informative. A lot of new viewpoints brought in, a lot of reminders of what, you know, again, the old truths we know. Um, so we thank you from the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, and we look forward to seeing you in our next discussion. Thank you so much and have a nice day.